Uh, this panel is on uh, innovation with the future of additive manufacturing, uh, moderated by uh, Pat, uh, Patrick Dempsey at LLNL here. Uh, also, uh, I'll let him do the rest of the panelist introductions, but let me tell you a little bit about Patrick since he didn't get to talk about himself earlier when he opened up the meeting. Uh, Patrick is uh, the manager of strategic engagements here at Lawrence Livermore. Uh, with over 25 years of experience delivering laboratory capabilities to the nation, uh, and as part of the uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab Director's senior staff, he is leading efforts to position the laboratory to best serve national efforts to stimulate the economy through advancement in science and technology. And maybe most excitingly, he is not only one of our primary contacts with uh, the city of Livermore and with iGate, but he also works for our own Buck Kuntz, uh, which gives us a lot of interaction. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Patrick. Thank you, Rob. So I was, I was particularly interested in the story I heard from uh, Chuck Alexander a minute ago from Solid Concepts. He was describing the ducting that he was making. Uh, I, early in my career, I worked for a general contractor building homes. And when the carpenter was done doing their beautiful work, the, the sheet metal guys came in to put their ducting and they did some subtractive manufacturing with chainsaws. Um, I'm glad that now I'm at a, at a conference where we're dealing with a little bit more of, shall we say, the cutting edge. Uh, and, and really, this panel, uh, we've, we've heard a lot about what's being done. We've heard about sort of some progress that's being made in this technology and how companies are putting this to work. Uh, in the prototyping area, in some places, in parts, uh, and we're seeing this progress really quickly. I, I was just impressed by, by seeing Scott's talk earlier today, uh, the difference between what I saw them doing a year ago, uh, what I saw them doing six months ago when I visited his studio, and what they're doing now. It's, it's just amazing how fast we're moving. And so this panel is to talk a little bit more about how fast we may be moving in the future. Uh, as I said, we're sort of talking about the cutting edge right now, but what's the cutting edge of the cutting edge, and what do, what do we expect to see in the future? That's what this panel is about, and, and so we have uh, speakers from d several different areas. Uh, we're going to try to cover the gamut here. Uh, first, I'll have Eric Duas come up, and I'll introduce each of them, and then they'll come up and speak. Uh, Eric Duas is one of the newer members of our staff here at Lawrence Livermore working in engineering and working in the exciting area of additive manufacturing or an additive manufacturing lab. You heard Chris Battaccini speak earlier. Uh, he works with Chris in that laboratory. Uh, he works on novel additive manufacturing techniques to create designer materials with unique microarchitectural properties. You heard a little bit about this from Chris. He's really dealing at the at the micro scales. This is what I talked about earlier. This is the, some, of the, some of the stuff you may not see, but is going to add capabilities to our, to our materials. Uh, Eric received his PhD in 2009 from the Department of Material Science and Engineering at the University of Illinois. After Eric, we'll move uh, to a larger scale, and we'll have uh, Baroque Kushnevich. I really probably messed that up. Uh, he is a professor of director and director of Center for Rapid Automated Fabrication Technologies at uh, UC Irvine. Uh, I, I watched a, I mean, UC, I'm sorry, uh, down south there. Uh, and uh, he's doing some exciting work at a larger scale. Uh, and the larger scale, I'll let him go into the details, but as I mentioned earlier, something you could live in. And these are things you can't see with the naked eye. Uh, so he is an inventor, a researcher, who has invented several additive manufacturing technologies, most notably the megascale fabrication technology called contour crafting that can build large industrial objects as well as whole buildings. He has uh, active projects in 3D printing of structures and is supported by NASA for uh, construction of infrastructure for human settlements on Moon and Mars using additive manufacturing. Then we will move to space uh, with Leonard Yowell, uh, who's Associate Center Chief Technologist for NASA Ames Research Center. Uh, he's Technical Director of the Advanced Digital Materials and Manufacturing for Space, called ATOMS, uh, initiative at NASA Ames. Uh, he is uh, re responsible or involved in uh, advanced technology development and nanomaterials research at the, in, in the past at Johnson Space Center uh, and has 
uh, had developed and applied this to human spaceflight applications. Most recently, Leonard has led efforts to establish the Innovative Design Center, IDC, at and a prototyping facility at NASA for their workforce to gain hands-on experience in a collaborative environment. So that is particularly helpful for some of the work we're doing here. And then to, to bring this back to Earth, uh, and, and both literally and figuratively, uh, I invited uh, Thomas Jensen to be part of this panel. And really, uh, this isn't uh, to, to talk to us about the future of added manufacturing, but really how is this future going to affect real life? Again, bringing it back down to Earth. Uh, he is a senior manager of design verification and validation at Tesla Motors. And he manages a team of engineers and technicians responsible for design and development of expanding test infrastructure for improving, improving product quality using innovative tools and processes. So with that, I will invite uh, Eric up to give an introduction of what he's working on. All right, so uh, as Patrick pointed out, I work with uh, Chris Battaccini, who was a panel member uh, earlier today. And the things that we're doing here at the lab are, uh, as Chris pointed out, very early stage R&D, TR TRL level, uh, you know, one to three. So the things I'll discuss about are uh, a short list of areas that we've identified for innovation and things that we're particularly, particularly interested in, in uh, here at the lab, but by, by no means a complete list. I know folks here have their own interests and, and probably have identified other areas for innovation. So one of the things that we're particularly interested in exploring is the uh, design space that additive manufacturing affords you uh, in terms of accessing designs that would be very difficult or impossible to achieve with subtractive manufacturing approaches. Uh, Chris showed you material properties for, uh, for example, Young's modulus versus density. You can also look at other material property combinations, such as, uh, in this case, coefficient of thermal expansion uh, and Young's modulus, and now design materials with completely new property combinations. Uh, so if you look here, this is actually a design uh, created here at the lab by postdoc Jonathan Hopkins. Uh, for a material that will give you uh, controlled uh, thermal expansion, uh, can also give you athermal properties or negative thermal expansion by changing the organization of two uh, materials that in and of themselves intrinsically have positive coefficients of thermal expansion. So the way that we do this is having uh, two materials in some lattice structure that when it's heated up, overall, the, the globally, the material will shrink. Uh, and uh, Jonathan Hopkins has designed an analytic modeling approach to create these, uh, for example, 2D unit cell structures and redistribute the material to give you that property combination that you target. Uh, the designs can also be readily extended to three-dimensional space, uh, such as this complex structure shown here. And if I have a... Ah, yeah, okay. Uh, so this is one of the design approaches that we're using, and we think that this is really enabled by uh, what additive manufacturing affords you in terms of building complexity, having multiple materials uh, intelligently uh, distributed within uh, a unit cell architecture. We've also worked on, a, uh, with our academic collaborator Dan Tortorelli at University of Illinois, a computational approach to materials design. Uh, so in this case, I think the movie already played, but um, Dan has a uh, essentially finite element code wrapped with an optimization algorithm that will uh, intelligently redistribute the materials. We're talking two materials plus void. And you can see that um, this crosshair uh, has turned from black to red. And when it turns from black to red, it's undergoing that transition from positive thermal expansion to negative thermal expansion. So this is important because now you can uh, sort of a priori design materials that give you the right thermal properties that you want. They can be athermal, they can have negative thermal expansion. Um, and you can also do this for different material properties. Uh, for example, this is a design that's been in the, the literature for a while now. Uh, it's a negative Poisson material. It's uh, completely man-made. You won't find this in nature. Uh, and as you can see, when you uniaxially strain this material, it expands laterally. Uh, this is, uh, the overall microarchitecture has what's known as a negative Poisson ratio. And what we're doing here at the lab, it's not ready for release yet, but we're also designing uh, new materials that have these tuned uh, 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 Poisson ratio uh, uh, values. 
Uh, and finally, in terms of materials design, we're also looking at uh, microarchitectures with controlled energy absorption properties. So in this case, we took one of our uh, additive micromanufacturing approaches and designed a micro lattice architecture uh, that when we now put it under different mechanical deformation, it gives us the load deformation profile that we want or we desire, whether that's in compress compression, tensile, or uh, torsion uh, uh, strain behavior. Okay, uh, and as Chris pointed out, we're looking at accessing what we're calling additive micromanufacturing processes or tools. And I just include this video because I think it's going to be a stark contrast from what uh, Barack is going to show you in a bit. This is actually now taking a functional ink uh, based upon titanium dioxide and printing it with a one micron nozzle. Uh, so as you know, with FDM approaches, typically the feature sizes are on the order of 100 microns or, or, or larger. Uh, so this is really starting to now push the feature size and resolution uh, of uh, materials that are printed three-dimensionally. And in this case, um, the overall material and structure gave you particular photonic properties. This is actually a photonic crystal that gives you an optical uh, band gap. Um, so that's an, another thing that we're interested in exploring is not only structural uh, materials, but also functional materials. And to do that with uh, this direct ink writing approach that we're working on uh, with Professor Jennifer Lewis at, at uh, Harvard University, we're developing functional ink materials or functional feedstock materials that uh, can't be uh, uh, accessed with traditional additive manufacturing approaches. So in this case, we're actually printing uh, spanning structures at essentially pre-programmed angles between two substrates of differing height, something akin to a wire bond. And these are uh, actually printed with a silver nanoparticle ink, which after a processing step becomes electrically conductive. So now this gives you the, the opportunity, as I mentioned, to combine uh, structural materials with, with uh, functional materials. And uh, not only that, you can now think about uh, printing onto three-dimensional substrates, conformally printing uh, your electronics, your photonics, magnetic materials, and so forth. Uh, in this case, we're printing onto a glass hemisphere uh, to create an electrically small antenna. Chris alluded to this earlier. And essentially come up with this antenna, which is electrically small, that is, it's, it's physically small with respect to the resonant wavelength. Uh, the overall an antenna here is on the order of two centimeters and the resonant wavelength is 15 centimeters. But really the point is that the design here is, is tunable. Uh, you can pre-program the resonant wavelength by changing uh, the pitch of this meander line and also changing the cross-section cross -section of, of the printed wire, the conductive elements of the antenna. And additive manufacturing, you can readily do that on the fly. Uh, you can change the design and, and print the part. And uh, so this isn't our work, but um, I noticed Frank Medina from, from UTEP was in the crowd earlier. And this is something that those folks at, at UTEP have uh, already done. They've essentially had a, a 3D printed component where they're integrating the electronics with this printed electronics approach um, to have something that is pushing towards smart systems, things that have uh, you know, structural properties, but also sensing diagnostic properties all within a single part. So that's one of the areas that we think uh, is ripe for innovation in added manufacturing. And uh, finally, uh, you know, this, I'm not particularly working on this, this project, but um, Wayne King, uh, who's here at the lab, has uh, stood up an, an effort on uh, creating multi-link scale, multi-time scale modeling capability for um, these uh, direct metal laser centering approaches. And we think that uh, what this can afford you is uh, essentially you know everything there is to know about your material and your process and your, your final printed part. So the aim here is to accelerate certification and qualification. And this is something that uh, we're focusing on for this DL D DMLS approach, but we think can be readily extended to, to new additive manufacturing approaches. And as Chris mentioned, uh, we're, we're very interested in developing process models for uh, our existing uh, AM processes and new processes. Um, yeah, this just sums up some of the areas that I, I believe are uh, ripe for innovation, things like new materials, processes, uh, properties and applications, uh, having seamlessly integrated design tools with predictive sim simulation. I, I know some of the folks uh, earlier today have alluded to this capability. Uh, process modeling, in-situ monitoring of the, of the additive manufacturing process, 
and accelerated qualification and certification. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention. Next, we have Dr. Koshnavis from USC, uh, and he will be bringing this from the micro scale to the macro scale. Uh, so I've been working for quite some time on uh, scaling up the uh, rapid prototyping or 3D printing uh, processes. Um, the technology that, are create, that I created, is, uh, I named it contour crafting. Um, the basic... Uh, method by which I can build larger stuff is um, creation of thicker layers. And uh, the problem with using thicker layers is that, of course, you'll, use, uh, you'll lose surface definition. Um, in order to control surface, I'm using a planar uh, blade, the, the trowel, basically, that confines the extruded as it comes out of the extrusion nozzle. And as you see, we can get nearly perfect uh, surfaces with very thick um, layers. You know, those layers there are about quarter of an inch. These are relatively small objects made out of uh, ceramic. So initially, I wasn't really thinking about buildings. I wanted to build large industrial objects, such as molds for um, big stuff like propellers of ships and submarines. Uh, so these are some of the ceramic stuff that we build. As you see, you can even get sharp corners and all kinds of shapes, overhangs, and so on. We came up with the methods of those. But then we extended the concepts to really using a structural material that are used in construction. Well, this image uh, shows a, a typical implementation scenario the machine is pretty light because it really doesn't have to have much payload. It uses, um, it basically moves a nozzle that extrudes soft material. Um, these rails are placed at the construction site fairly quickly, laser aligned, and the machine is erected. You bring the material and uh, the architectural design on a flash drive. You put it in the controller, you press a button, the building gets built. So based on uh, experiments that we have built, we have done with a machine like this. This is one of our machines. This machine is only about 250 kilograms, 500 pounds, very light. It's very agile, makes almost no noise. Imagine construction without any noise, without dust. We use wet concrete, so there's really no dust. You wake up one day and next to your house, there's another house. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, this is um, one of the nozzles. Again, we have created a lot of different variations. This nozzle produces those concrete walls that have got a uh, hollow core, you know, with uh, a corrugated structure inside. One of the main challenges here is the system of material delivery. You know, concrete is a very difficult material. It's not a homogeneous Newtonian fluid. It is a nasty material, actually. It's got a lot of sand and gravel in it. Uh, also, it's got a lot of air bubbles in it. So it's kind of like sponge. It's compressible. So what you press on one end of the hose does not necessarily come out exactly at the same rate at the other end of the hose. Um, so regulating such a flow is very difficult. And uh, that has been what has taken a lot of my time. Um, but as you see there, it's been very much worth it, all the effort. We can produce things that are impossible to do otherwise at the time that we can do them, at the speed and cost that we can do them. Imagine if you were to build that S-care wall, you have to build formwork with lumber. Now how would you just do that? You know, you have to follow a mathematical curve. If it is doubly curved, it's just hopeless, you know. You have to basically create a mold with CNC, uh, and a sacrificial mold. We are building without any formwork, without any mold, at a pretty impressive speed. 
Um, this is a typical structure, you know, probably the largest structure ever built by additive manufacturing. There's a hollow concrete wall section. Um, it's a pretty strong concrete, as you see here. This concrete, which is reinforced with fiber, it is only four layers high. Every layer here is about one inch, so four inches. We flipped it 90 degrees. 10 hours after fabrication, those three students are standing on it. So you can build beams for buildings with this, for the roofs, over, uh, for, for lentils, for doors and windows. Um, as you know, concrete will gain its maximum strength in 28 days. So in 28 days, that beam is going to be even stronger. So that's the kind of strength that we can deliver. We have methods of automatic embedding uh, reinforcement. Uh, this is a steel coil reinforcement. Or it could be nichrome wire for heating. We can put uh, automatically uh, sensors that are powered using conductive concrete, wireless sensors. Those brown ones could be conductive concrete. You add graphite to concrete, much like ceramic resistors, it becomes conductive. Of course, uh, there is a translucent concrete that we can use for certain sections of the building. Robotically, there are many methods. Uh, that one was a gantry system for single residential. This is for multi-nozzle system for uh, large buildings, you know, schools, hospitals, apartment buildings. Or you can make a, a climbing platform as it builds uh, the building. It, it just rises. Uh, we actually have a contract right now from a prominent company to build the structures that are about 400 feet high. Uh, well, this <coughs> is one of the ways by leaving the sections of tubes in the layers, you can create pegs. The current NASA project is for building uh, on Moon and Mars uh, using in situ material. So we have uh, experimented with the lunar regolith uh, and um, Martian regolith simulants uh, th that are available. And um, we have different methods. One of the methods is uh, basically melting the regolith at 1100 centigrade and extruding it. So without using water, we are building structures there. We have other methods for building high temperature structures for landing pads, uh, for landers. Uh, so back to the construction on Earth, uh, this is what constitutes the cost of construction, is financing, materials, and labor. Since we build almost instantaneously, your financing cost is almost eliminated. Our materials will be a little bit more expensive. Uh, we're doing R&D, companies that do R&D, they have to recover from that. But we have no waste. Computer precisely adds what needs to be added, where it needs to be added, and we almost eliminate labor. Uh, so as far as cost comp uh, competitive landscape, the construction cost is even lower than prefab, only higher than tents, emergency. As far as architectural flexibility is concerned, nothing really can beat um, contour crafting. We can build all kinds of exotic structures. And because of the curvatures that we can use, we can give a lot of strength to the buildings. The worst kind of structures are planar walls with respect to strength. If you curve them a tiny bit, you'll see that they become much stronger. Just take a piece of paper and try to hold it straight up. It will collapse. But just bend it a little bit, curve it a tiny bit, you'll see how much strength it gains. As far as environmental impact and energy usage, it's just no comparison. It's uh, much friendlier to the environment, uh, much more effective with respect to energy usage. 
uh, primarily all these people who drive back and forth to the construction site for weeks and months, uh, that is compressed to a number of hours. And therefore, you save all that fuel and reduce the load on the traffic and reduce emission. Uh, of course, there are many impacts, economic, employment, social, regulatory, environmental, and architectural impacts. The employment impact is a sensitive one. Of course, people ask what's going to happen to these construction workers. Well, it's not a new question. When a steam engine was invent invented, it was the same question. What's going to happen to these carriage drivers? When I was doing my thesis dissertation, um, I used to write on a piece of papers and then give it to a person uh, uh, called typist. There was an army of typists around at the time. None of them are around now. The beginning of the 19th century, 20th century, excuse me, 1900 some, 62 percent of Americans were farmers. Today, one and a half percent are farmers. So the world did not come to an end as a result of effective agricultural technologies. The same will be true in the domain of construction. Thank you. By the way, let me just show quickly one video that they allowed me to show. So you get an idea. For those of you who have seen uh, layered fabrication, the speed of it, you can compare here. Yeah, this is the ceramic uh, parts being built. So this is real time. It's much, much faster than what 3D printing, the way you know it does it. So that trowel changes angle on fly. This is a true 3D object being built. This is concrete. So again, extrusion of this concrete really is not an easy matter. If you try to extrude concrete, you'll notice that all the juices go in first and all the sand stays behind. This is that full scale wall being built. It's a different nozzle now. It builds them every layer in two paths. So this concrete has got a very low slump. We have managed to do that using uh, proper admixtures that have been formulated. Again, it has composite fiber in it. It's very strong. It's about 10,000 pounds per square inch of compressive strength. Your regular concrete is about 3,000. And of course, as I said, we can make walls uh, that are curved with no additional effort. So this is one typical scenario uh, that my students animated. Uh, I didn't want to give them a hard time to make curved walls, but you can imagine that these walls can be curved. Thank you. I'm sending you the design for my next house. Okay, next we have uh, Leonard Yell from NASA Ames. Good afternoon. I have just uh, three slides to share with you uh, this afternoon with the hopes that it'll um, spark some discussion, maybe some thoughts, uh, maybe some questions here on the panel uh, or at the breaks or, or as, as we might want to follow up later. Um, and I really appreciate being on this panel. It's a really good, see the, the, the flow here, which is really great. Um, Two things I want you to think about from this slide. Uh, this is your space program, right? So, so NASA, we, we fly people and, and things into space. Um, additive manufacturing has a lot to bring um, 
and we're just on the early stages of it, bringing uh, benefit to human spaceflight in two different, or in, in spaceflight in two different ways. The first is kind of traditional. So everything we've launched into space so far, um, you know, 50 plus, 50 years ago, um, and until now, has all been conceived of on the Earth in one gravity, uh, one G. Um, it's been designed, built, you know, tested, and then an enormous amount of energy uh, to take every bit that we want to take into space uh, is taken and, and performs uh, various missions, exploration, and science communications, um, either in orbit or beyond, right, in, in, uh, in deeper space. And uh, you've heard some talks today, you know, rockets, uh, rocket components, um, parts of the space station, uh, a lot of different ways that additive manufacturing, advanced manufacturing um, can come to play to solve a couple problems. One is that process of um, designing things here, building here, overcoming these constraints, these key constraints were very mass, volume, energy constrained. But launch environments, pretty tricky to design for, for delicate instrumentation. It takes a long time and it's very costly right now, as you well know, to launch things and, and, uh, and operate in space. So anything that helps shorten those time frames, uh, prototyping um, to actually the, the actual useful parts that are certified uh, has a lot to bear. But there's another thing, so that's a traditional way. As NASA goes further and further away from Earth on longer and longer duration missions, potentially with humans, we are going to need to take more and more stuff, more and more consumables, more and more things, and it'll be harder and harder to get those things. So Brock kind of highlighted this with habitats, right? And using uh, potentially as you go further out here to the right, you go to a planetary surface, you go to the moon, you go to Mars in fractional gravity environments, instead of taking all the construction materials with you, can you use what you have available uh, to, to build? And in this case, it wouldn't be nice to have stuff. Uh, it's, it's something that you may, in fact, need and need to rely on. Human lives may, may be at risk. So um, if it doesn't work. So I'll, I'll get to some of the R&D uh, bits in a little bit. I think Gonzalo uh, showed some uh, pictures of the the, uh, the people floating here, you can tell they're in a, in a different environment. These are, both these pictures are from the reduced gravity uh, aircraft, the parabolic flights, you know, about 20 seconds of microgravity. These were our baby steps toward getting toward producing parts uh, in space. The one on the left is the maiden space, that's uh, the extrusion based, you know, FDM type polymer printing. Uh, the one on the right is uh, metal uh, wire electron beam freeform fabrication, been tested in. Uh, in the parabolic flights, and Maiden Space will fly here in the next year or two and demonstrate a print in space. Um, I would argue, you know, NASA is not a, uh, we are a buyer, but we are not uh, market makers, right? We don't ever really buy enough to really make an, uh, an entire industry successful. Uh, however, by hitting these constraints, by working to these constraints, I would argue can drive innovation, has historically driven innovation to where new markets that we aren't even conceiving of um, can develop. So something to pay attention to, both from the traditional and the non-traditional of producing in space and being uh, self-sustaining. So these, this slide is just on, uh, for, I guess from, from our perspective, from my perspective, some of the R&D needs, uh, critical R&D needs that we'll have to make the, the previous slide a reality. Uh, feedstock innovation, so um, in, on the moon and, and Mars, you can imagine using the, the regolith, the soil, right, or even parts of the atmosphere in Mars uh, to build your constituent blocks. But if you're in microgravity or in a long transit, you may have to reuse materials. Uh, you have to decide very um, uh, intently what you want to take with you, what you may need to make uh, along the way. So I think we have a long way to go there. Um, synthetic biology, we may use biological systems and hybrid systems to uh, create materials that, that, that we may need. Um, and I'll put in a plug here for modeling and simulation. It was mentioned earlier, uh, Eric mentioned it, several other speakers have mentioned uh, modeling and simulation. We've gotten to where we are today after, after a lot of trial and error, uh, empirical routes to, to, to advancements and, and innovation. Uh, now the computing power is such that we can look at true multi-scale modeling from quantum mechanics and what we now use supercomputers for um, all the way up through atomistic molecular dynamics simulations then to the bulk, the continuum, the, the things we can, we can look at and touch um, to speed up. If you've ever heard of the materials genome initiative, uh, you know, speeding up so we don't have to wait decades and decades and generations for new materials to develop. Um, as you look at cr uh, the 
conceive of crew uh, humans on Mars, let's say, on the surface of Mars for a long time, um, or robotic missions for that matter, uh, automated processes are gonna be particularly important, as well as uh, certification. Now, we've talked about certification so far today, but this is, you know, when you're millions of miles away and really can't, may not be able to remake a part, uh, and it needs to work in, let's say, a critical life support system, um, that, that's really of interest in NASA, and we need to, to, uh, to put more attention on that. I'll put in just a, 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 a just mention digital materials here. Uh, Professor Neil Gershenfeld at MIT, he's been a, a big advocate of this. We're interested as well. Um, digital materials can mean a lot of things, but think of Legos, right, discrete, discrete components. Think of Legos uh, minus the toy aspect, which we've all enjoyed playing with Legos, but the functional Lego, um, being able to reconfigure and reuse discrete components, you know, if they're insulating and conducting, semiconducting, structural pieces. Um, one, this, uh, the, the cubes you see here, just one project along these lines that we're working on at, at NASA Ames would be to put all the avionics, uh, all your common systems in a small satellite, in a CubeSat, uh, in the sidewalls, 3D printed, integrated, to leave the entire interior volume for payload and to have that whole thing just snap fit, friction fit, just put it together uh, very easily to get rapid access to space if we're going that traditional route, if we're going the launch it into space, maybe build it in a day or hours for a launch opportunity or have kits aboard the International Space Station, for instance, so that when someone here has an idea for a science experiment or any sort of experiment, they can launch data, it was mentioned earlier, right? It's easy to launch data and to ship data, not so much for materials. So, and they could just kick it out, build it, and kick it out of the airlock, and your satellite's launched without ever launching anything. Um, last slide. This we think is particularly important, uh, has a lot to do with um, accessing talent and creative minds in really any organization. We're hoping in your organizations too. Uh, we can't get to being self-sustaining on Mars without the help of everyone. We, NASA has never done anything really by itself. Um, so we need academia and industry and other federal labs to, to be engaged. In this case, we have the space shop where we're trying to give our entire workforce access to prototyping equipment, the right tools at the right time for their right ideas. Uh, additive is a piece, um, subtractive also a piece. And we have this on the very second floor of our main machine shop at NASA Ames. So we think there's a, a really especially in space flight, it is really important to take advantage of the decades of experience we have in flying things in space, which is very difficult. Um, traditional techniques, let's say, combining that with prototyping and some of the more accessible techniques that are coming online and will come online, and having uh, generations really um, kind of cross-pollinate on ideas and build things together. Uh, so with that, I'll close and look forward to your questions. like what Leonard and NASA Ames is doing related to their tech shop and sort of like, I guess, a fab lab concept that you have and similar to, to tech shops we have. And I think that's very, very much a part of what we could do as part of a collaborative, which we'll be talking about later. So next we have uh, our visitor from uh, Tesla Motors uh, and Tom Jensen is going to hopefully bring us back down to earth and tell us a little bit of what he's doing there. Uh, he asked, why am I part of this panel? This is about the future of added manufacturing. Maybe he's not the person to speak about that, but again, I thought it would be good to sort of end with him uh, as far as the formal part of this presentation to sort of get his views on what he's hearing here and how that might apply to his work. So, thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been at Tesla Motors going on a year and a half now, and I came out of a 20-person company, a startup that I had founded, and so it was, it was quite a change for me, but I'm really enjoying Tesla. And um, I have my, my hands in things involving testing of the assemblies that we're going to uh, eventually produce in the car. So you know, prior to production release, we shake and bake and beat up all of these uh, assemblies. And uh, we work on not only the uh, mechanical, but also the electrical and firmware aspects of these assemblies and how, the, how all the uh, different functions interact. And uh, let's see, I need to get my slides up. Thank 
you. Mm -hmm. So when I uh, began at, at Tesla, I had uh, uh, the first job of uh, validating some of the drive inverter components, the, the drive unit of the car. And so we had a lot of simulations that we had run. And uh, I'll get to that slide in a second. But um, the, uh, some of the findings were that we, we had some problems with the thermal uh, modeling as it uh, applied, you know, once we, we tested the real parts, we, it, the, the simulation didn't quite match. So that was, uh, it was, it's been challenging to overcome some of the problems and uh, I, I love uh, solving problems. Uh, so now, as far as this first slide, uh, I think one of the most fascinating things is the assembly line at Tesla. It, it truly is uh, a world-class assembly line. The robotics and the systems that are used to, to build the cars are uh, just in great to, to be involved with. I'm, I'm learning so much from the people that have put those systems in place. And they have a lot more big ideas for future systems. Um, we do use additive processes in development of the, the car and uh, different components of the car. And also our suppliers are are using some of these processes. Uh, we have some fusion depth and uh, sintering and uh, SLA units in-house, and then our suppliers also have quite a bit of capability. Um, I was formerly also with IDO. I don't know if you're, any of you are familiar with uh, IDO. It's based in Palo Alto and offices all over the world, but um, they also uh, collaborate with, with Tesla from time to time on uh, modeling, and um, they have a lot of additive capabilities there as well. Um, at the Numi plant that was Toyota's plant, we uh, began putting the assembly lines together about a year and a half ago, and then the car was launched last summer. So it was a spectacular effort to get to the point of production in, in about a year. And as you can see from the couple of pictures there, there's a lot of uh, automation at play. And uh, the, the site is huge. It's 370 acres, five and a half million internal square feet. Um, and it's mostly just uh, a ghost town inside from the former uh, NUMI operation where they were producing hundreds of thousands of vehicles. We're on a, on a, a track to produce 20,000 this year. And so uh, many of the areas of the plant are just now being built out and the whole center of it is still dark. It's, it's kind of interesting to wonder about the plant. It's a little bit like uh, the past and the future because the, the new production areas are bright white with these robotics and uh, the old areas are much like you'd see in Detroit. It's uh, these old uh, chain driven assembly lines and uh, it's very also dusty and, and still the old plant that was you know shuttered I think uh, in 2010. So uh, in the back of the plant is a stamping mill and uh, the paint shop, so there's a lot of, it's a very uh, kind of horizontal uh, process that we have, and we do have a, a many, about 300 suppliers, but uh, many of the parts are made there, all the stamped metal parts for the chassis. And then there's a full test track and a service center. So just a little background on the, the Fremont plant. And um, as far as the products that Tesla has uh, built in the past, it just one car, the Tesla Roadster was uh, the prior model to today's production model and uh, it sold for about four years, 2,250 cars were built and the car was uh, pretty much a breakthrough, first kind of like real sports car that had uh, serious performance and some decent range. And then the car that was launched last June, which is now in full production is the Model S. Um, maybe you've seen these driving around the area here and for, many, for any of you who are from the Bay Area. I, I see them every day when I drive to work, at least three or four of them over on the peninsula. And um, it was Motor Trend's car of the year last year, or for this year, but they announced it in late last year. And so far, 2,650 cars produced. Well, that's up through Q4 of last year, and then uh, they're, they're, at, they're going at the rate of about 55 cars a day right now. So uh, that's pretty much the capacity. And um, the car has th uh, two choices of battery packs. They just changed uh, in terms of the, the choices. And uh, the, top, the, the top battery pack is 85 kilowatt hours. 
and uh, allows about 265 miles of uh, conservative range. And uh, it's very fast. It's very smooth too, just one gear. So when you step on it, it, it gets up and goes. It's a great car. As far as sales centers, there are uh, 33 sales locations today. They're expanding rapidly and uh, currently in 14 states. Just about to launch the European car, just about to launch the uh, Chinese variant and um, free delivery when you purchase one, they, they'll bring it to anywhere in the lower 48. So um, a little about myself, I uh, just, as I said, I manage design validation of the components of the car. I have a team of uh, 15. I work with about five other test teams. We work in close cooperation to align our testing. And we, lately, we've uh, started talking with SpaceX, our sister company in LA. And I'll be traveling down there soon to work on uh, commonality between all the systems that we're using. And they have uh, many of the same problems, even though a spacecraft is, is quite different than an automobile that's mass produced and used by the public, uh, many of the issues that we face in, in manufacturing are, are similar and also in the way that we test the car. So um, I think that's about all I have. Um, I'll take questions at the end. Thank you. So I'm going to open it up for questions from the audience. I've got some of my own, but I'd rather have uh, the audience ask questions of any of our panelists. Scott, and we'll get you a I repeat the question too, because I think there's others listening. Okay, I think the question was: Are we looking at uh, better, uh, hyper-efficient radiator, radiators for the thermal control system? And now that you can 3D print beryllium and, and uh, other materials like that, which are, have good heat properties. Well, uh, Scott, I, I don't know exactly the answer to that, but I would be happy to look into it, and uh, we can talk maybe uh, offline about it. structures. Yes, we do have method, uh, a method of uh, embedding uh, conventional reinforcement. But instead of these continuous rebars, we have segmented rebars. So for every so many layers, we have these segments of rebar that are assembled into the previous one. Uh, they just screw onto them. And, and we can build a two-dimensional mesh into the wall structure. If you go to YouTube, and search for contour crafting, one of the videos shows that. That and automatic plumbing and electrical network installation. We have a microphone here for any questions. You've shown this uh, functional inks that were distributed on surfaces of parts. And uh, so far I've seen you just showing it a continuous motion. Uh, you know, one of the challenges, I think, would be to interrupt the flow of ink for precision deposition. Are you dealing with this issue, and that work for you? Right. I, I, the question is, can we print, I think, discrete uh, droplets or segments? And the answer to that is uh, yes. Uh, it is a uh, filamentary-based printing technique, so we design our inks accordingly for that purpose. Uh, but alternatively, we can change the rheological properties so that we can start and stop uh, very accurately and um, print droplets or segments. <coughs> I, I can show you some of that work as well. 
Um, it's not like uh, inkjet printing where you can do um, very rap rapid uh, droplet generation. It's not uh, generating you know, starts and stops that quickly, but we can do it. I have a question for Professor, Professor Koshnavis. In the image that you showed of a lunar colony being assembled, the contour crafting robot had an articulated arm and it was on wheels. Right. And yet all the experimental apparatus appeared to be based on a Cartesian system. Are you experimenting with an articulated arm to create organic or irregular forms? Yes, we have experimented with uh, basically industrial robots. Uh, so the choice of robotics are many, you know. Um, the gantry has a lot of advantages if, if your volume is limited. Uh, it is still the most accurate, I, I believe, uh, con consistently. The resolution is consistent throughout the volume. Uh, the Joint structure, of course, uh, has more versatility. You can build very large area, you know, you can move. The robot that you saw there is JPL's athlete robot. Uh, it's already a NASA built robot that we're gonna assemble this uh, articulated arm onto. Uh, so since uh, over there, Everything has to be done autonomously. These are precursor missions. Before humans go there, we like to be able to build landing pads, blast protection walls, roads, hangars for landers and other equipment, and shade walls. Uh, so this has to be all done autonomously. And making a gantry would, would limit the situation. You have to take it from a place and assemble it in another place. So a robot on a on wheel like that is much more suitable for that kind of application. Question up here in front. Uh, for Eric, uh, you mentioned a term, I think I heard it, TRL one, two, or three. I think I know what that is, but maybe others don't. Could you explain it? Uh, so TRL is technology readiness level? And um, for, for us, um, I'm, I'm maybe not the best person to explain this, but um, we work at the lower levels are very uh, early stage R&D, not quite ready for uh, production. And then there's this um, historical valley of death, I think, that spans between um, TRL 3 to, others can correct me if I'm wrong, 6 or 7. And then, and then beyond that is where you have things that are actually uh, ready for manufacturing, ready for production. So it's, it's a way, I think, um, commonly used by government funding agencies to characterize how, how ready a technology is for implementation. More questions? Uh, What is the TRL for the uh, lattice structure that you were showing where you, ha you can invent the ma design the material to have negative thermal conductivity? Co sorry, coefficient of... Uh, yeah, I, I, I would say um, that, that particular design and uh, process to produce it is, is again, a TRL one to two. Uh, we're working to, to take it to three but it's still a work in progress. So I have a question, Baroque. Uh, what is the TRL level of the uh, house building machine? I, I would rate it at five to six. Right so when, are, when are we gonna see our first house? Hopefully, or building? In, hopefully in two years. Okay. Right. So yeah, we are capable of building this house, this the house right now. Uh, it just needs a different uh, kind of uh, arrangement uh, other than university. I have an uh, USC is very limited with respect to space, so I have a laboratory. If I build a house inside that laboratory, 
I can't build anything else, right? <laughs> <laughs> it will be under the machine forever. So I have to demolish it and move it out. Our focus right now is on the process. We're trying to uh, research the process and, and improve it in many different directions. So we're less concerned about making a demonstration of a full structure. You know, if you build a wall, obviously, you can build four walls and that will be a room. If you build a room, you can build several rooms and that will be a house. So for me, it's a done deal. <laughs> for me, it's TRLA. You haven't seen my design yet. 